A very warm welcome to the RUSI CPAC Conference 2021 from London in the UK. And a special welcome and shout out to RUSI members. Uh, we're delighted to have you with us. I'm Peter Roberts, Director of Military Sciences at the Institute, formerly the Senior Research Fellow for CPAC here, a role now filled by Dr. Siddharth Korshal, who is your conference organiser today and who undertakes the duties of CPAC Research Fellow in a much more rigorous fashion than was previously the case. We've been running these events, these CPAC conferences, for about 20 years as a location for serious discussion about sea power that fills that nexus between policymakers, academics, the military and industry. There's been a push since the 2000s to end this idea of single service conferences at RUSI and make everything joint. It's something we often review. I mean, there's no doubt that domains merge in some places, assets, platforms, people owned and operated by one service have utility in other domains. Yet the idea that somehow everything is now joint or integrated doesn't have much evidence to back it up. And as a claim is somewhat spurious. Indeed, the temptation to remove the specialist discussion in domains and replace it with a ubiquitous event designed to tip hats at lots of fads is not something we've been in favor of. Today, as always, it's vital that we allow space for discussions by specialists about their domains, their work, their doctrine, tactics, ways of fighting. We must continue to acknowledge the requirement for separate discussions on these matters in the same way that armies still need to have separate discussions about the utility of armor, urban combat or counterinsurgency. There's also space for discussions about the approach to fighting each domain is experiencing or sees itself experiencing over the coming decade. In armies, we see such doctrine developed in a deliberate and programmatic way with eyes to the long term, generating exceptional results for land force employment models emanating from the US Army Futures Command, the Australian Army, CGS's concept team, or the land doctrine and concepts coming out of the French Army. Each approach and model is contextual, backed by sometimes five, six years worth of research, technical modeling, operational analysis, wargaming, and tested with allies and adversaries. It is then reviewed almost annually. The result is a coherent understanding of the future battle space by land forces, which links then to their own conceptual design of the future and hopefully a roadmap over how to get there from where they exist today. Now, Western navies, unlike their counterparts in competitive states, seem to shy away from this intellectual rigor somehow, perhaps because rightly they claim to be in use every day but also because they seem able somehow to feel they can complete whatever intellectual effort is required in three months that others take more than a decade to acquire. And then, of course, for naval strategies and plans, they sometimes sit on a shelf gathering dust as opposed to become something that they use on a daily basis. It's a weakness in navies and a mission more than a few former naval leaders have admitted to. Yet in not engaging in a long-term discussion, navies risk falling into an intellectual abyss and their naval force designs for the future can become based on core concepts of platform replacements determined by hull life and buttressed by some rather dated concepts of sea control and sea denial, assisted by a heavy dose of technological and financial optimism. Worse still, their occasional forays into conceptual force planning expands on these biases and becomes maybe a science fiction experiment with technology at its heart. But underpinning these different approaches are different core philosophies. The primary intellectual linkage of armies is a belief that success in combat is determined by the creative skill of the commander and the fighting ability of the human. For navies, the primary intellectual linkage is often with technology. The platforms that sailors use every day are what they have to fight with and what they will have to fight with for the next decade. And therefore, their success is determined by the capabilities of those vessels, their sensors and weapons. This dynamic makes for interesting outcomes over a period of time. Indeed, whilst to sailors, soldiers spend huge amounts of time thinking about fighting that they're able to luxuriate in during the peacetime between wars. So to soldiers, sailors spend too much of their time talking about power projection and they forget about the reality of combat, perhaps scared of discussions about how they might fight in anything more than peaceful skirmishes. Both sides have valid points. Yet as we're here to discuss naval matters and we're not afraid to take on arguments and debate, let us consider for a moment that the soldiers have a valid point. In a recent report on the US Navy, CMSS 
in uh, concluded that the relationship between naval personnel and their units, including how they were employed, meant that the US Navy as a fighting force had forgotten how to fight. Too much focus on operations today, on making platforms work, and on power projection had left naval personnel somewhat detached from their realistic preparations for future war. Indeed, naval perceptions about war and what that might look like at sea seems to be missing from discussion today. The scarce conversations that do tend to take place tend to express considerable confidence that on the basis of war games and exercises, Western navies can confidently overcome a numerically superior peer adversary with minimal impact on themselves. A US Navy once posed a revealing challenge that is worth taking up. It's instructive to ask a room of senior officers the last time they played in or even heard of a naval game or exercise where Red Forces won. Free play in Western exercises is really never free, unconstrained or open. It remains heavily scripted, free from risk and unguided by adversarial thinking. This is perhaps not the best way for uh, competitive environments and long wars of the coming eras. This is according to that report. That point about long wars is important. Whilst numerous studies, including those from my team at RUSI, continue to point to the fact that military campaigns are likely to be much longer and much more bloody than we have previously come to imagine, it's against this we need to consider whether Western navies are still preparing themselves for those campaigns or the short ones. Currently, sailors prepare, work up, deploy, conduct constabulary operations or power projection roles and return to base port, conduct maintenance and move on. This approach to campaigns, viewing them as a series of six month windows of operational activity at range, accompanied by safe base porting arrangements in between, is the naval equivalent of barracks mentality. With all the associated issues in poor performance for endurance, unhealthy approaches to risk management and the loss of key skills every year from platforms. Rotating people through those platforms tends to exacerbate these issues rather than curing them. And the Royal Navy's own experience with the crew swap trial of the 2000s was full of such lessons, all of which have relevance today. Studies that have examined effectiveness, readiness and lethality of naval forces all point in a single direction. The focus on power projection and constabulary operations reduces effectiveness in wartime. It's the age old dilemma facing states and their militaries prepare for the worst or undertake whatever duties validate peacetime force levels. It's the utility versus utilization argument. The good news in the UK is that ministers are acknowledging this publicly. In a Western Way of War podcast with me last year, the UK Minister of the Armed Forces, James Heapy, forcefully made the point that UK armed forces were facing a choice deliver activity in what's called the sub-threshold, grey zone, hybrid space, all of which are pretty poorly defined, or prepare for high-end war fighting. Given the budgets and force levels, that choice is stark and binary, at least according to the Minister of the Armed Forces. The choice will be harder still for navies with scarce capital assets, because leadership must decide whether the power projection of their carrier forces, for example, can really be regarded as credible warfighting tools given the risks associated with their deployment to higher risk areas. Whilst the French aircraft carrier Charles de Gaulle and her carrier strike group deployed to the Indian Ocean this week, a few weeks behind the French amphibious strike group, HMS Queen Elizabeth and the UK carrier strike group is currently scheduled to deploy to the Indo-Pacific later in the year. Such dilemmas are at the crux of the conference today. The distinction between peace and war is increasingly blurred as nation's strategic and operational concepts come to encompass the full spectrum of competitive measures. Scholars have been describing this for years as the unwar, the non-peace, the forever war. And the UK's integrated operating concept released this year seems to be finally catching up with that thinking, albeit perhaps with solutions designed for the last war, not the next. Yet there is also an urgent need to examine the ways by which naval force structures, postures and concepts of operations will need to adjust to a strategic concept in which husbanding forces for high intensity clashes will no longer suffice. It's if that was the theory Western navies were operating to, although it bore little resemblance to the reality of constant rotational deployments in the name of power projection. And so we get to the conversation that we wanted to have at this conference. How can maritime forces simultaneously deliver persistent effects 
in the context of limited competition, whilst somehow retaining the capacity to engage in limited warfighting capabilities at higher levels of intensity. All of the research and operational experience would indicate that this nirvana is just not achievable, but there may yet still be a way through this. Stay with us today to see if we can find a solution. The reality of naval operations is that ships will continue to be deployed on operations even as the battle space around them changes, as the geopolitics and international relations fall, as political domestic agendas play out and as behaviors on battlefields radically change. If, for example, the lessons from land warfare transfers to the sea, any omission or uh, of any platform spells death. What does this mean for carrier groups, air wings or deployed units? How ready are national and coalitional forces able to conduct silent and darkened operations, unplugged and disconnected? Alone and unafraid may be the mantra for some, but it does not seem to be reflected in the normal or warfighting doctrines of any naval service in the West, possibly with the exception of Israel. We must really beware of notions of a maritime era that smack of hubris in this. In this. The expectation might well be one where our sailors are expected to take more risk in the future rather than less. The presumptions and assumptions of risk, loss and gain need to be checked against those of the adversary and not simply reflect an inward facing idea of what we wish was the case. Discussion might well be triggered by our speakers, a really august group today, but the key will be in the questioned observations and interventions by you, the delegates and the audience. In advance of your actions, we want to thank you, our delegates, for joining us today and for engaging with this discussion and debate. The conference is only possible because of the good people at Palantir, our conference sponsors today. We're trialing a new conference platform and would welcome your feedback on the form in the platform itself or after the event sent to any one of us. That said, I am delighted to welcome back to the Institute Vice Admiral Jerry Kidd, the Royal Navy's fleet commander, who's kindly agreed to open the conference. Jerry is a good friend of the Institute, a naval officer who demonstrates not just flair and wit, but clarity and lucidity in decision making, balancing the theology of naval business with the reality of life at the sharp end. Eminently joint by nature, his business has been in naval warfighting for nearly 40 years. Representing so many with a similar experience across their careers, Jerry served on operational deployments in the Gulf, Kosovo, Northern Ireland, the Baltic, Indian Ocean, and the wider Atlantic. Having qualified as a bridge watch keeper, navigator and PO, I sense his one regret is never being a fighter controller, but that might just be my own bias. His list of seaborne commands include the frigate HMS Monmouth, the carrier HMS Ark Royal, the UK carrier strike group, and of course, HMS Queen Elizabeth. And for those with an army background, this is the equivalent to command at regiment, brigade and divisional levels. Critically, in this day and age, Derry has also considerable experience in training and personnel, not just in managing people, but as the captain of Britannia Royal Naval College in Dartmouth, the home of the Royal Navy's leadership, leadership academy. He's also been at the forefront of capability and tactics development as a desk officer for the highly successful Type 26 frigate program and as an instructor at the Maritime Warfare School. As a vice admiral in his current role of fleet commander, Jerry is responsible for commanding all operational elements of the Naval Service and acting as Joint Commander for the North Atlantic operating areas. Given the pressures on Naval presence around the world and challenges in the North Atlantic operational area, that is a considerable portfolio. So we're delighted he's been able to make time for us today. Jerry, welcome back to the Institute. It's a great pleasure to have you with us again. Jerry, the floor is yours. Right. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and, and thank you, Peter, as always, for the uh, invitation to, to again talk uh, here at RUSI. It's uh, a real privilege, and I have to say a pleasure, and I'm very grateful for this slot this afternoon. It's disappointing, of course, that I'm not speaking to you uh, in person. I think we're all getting used to this forum now, uh, and I think it works well. Uh, but in a way, perhaps more appropriate, because my speech, of course, is reaching many of you through uh, undersea data cables. Uh, so straight away, we've, we've established the importance of the maritime before even starting. Um, anyway, I'm going to move on quickly now. I, and thanks, Bill. I'll speak for about uh, 18, 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll see where we go with questions. But I think this year is uh, seminal for the Royal Navy and for UK CPAP. Uh, we celebrate the 80th anniversary of the Atlantic Charter, of course, signed on HMS Prince of Wales off the coast of Newfoundland back in 1941. In the midst of a global conflict, 
Um, it laid out a vision for an open and stable and, uh, I suppose, a just uh, post-war world. And central to this would be the reaffirmation of a historic concept, that of freedom of the high seas. A term we use a lot, but we very rarely really analyse properly, freedom of the high seas. In the 80 years since, this simple but incredibly powerful principle has driven an explosion in global prosperity. We can no doubting about that. Every nation, in many ways, is now a maritime nation, uh, joined by an £8 trillion pound maritime trade network, all, of course, enabled by the maintenance of a secure maritime environment in which all nations can exercise their freedom of navigation. Now, the area of persistent competition in maritime boils down to this. Uh, there is, in my view, a fault line between those who support this universally beneficial status quo and, of course, those now who wish to disrupt it. If nations and navies support it don't stand up for these values, I'm afraid there are plenty others, it seems to me, who will fill that vacuum. And I'm afraid they will be relentless in doing so, respecting neither the dots and eyes of international law uh, nor the line that you brought up earlier, Peter, between conflict and the soft threshold or the peace zone, bending, if you like, the boundaries uh, to suit themselves. The Prime Minister has made his position clear. Uh, last February in Greenwich, of course, the seat of naval navigation, uh, he set out his vision for modern, outward-looking and globally engaged UK. The remaking the case for free trade and his announcements on the Integrated Review before Christmas backed this up. It's an exciting time, therefore, for the Royal Navy, and we are being invested in to transform for a broader role in this national endeavour. And so for us, it's about two things, I think national opportunity and global responsibility. So taking the first, national opportunity, because as Britain continues to engage with emerging and new markets and the so-called tilt to the Far East, the Royal Navy is uniquely placed on behalf of the country to promote and safeguard our national prosperity. And on global responsibility, because as we do so in an age of persistent competition, it's more important than ever, I think, that we do our part to maintain the global maritime commons that makes all that possible. Navies have a future, navies remain uber relevant. So national opportunity, perhaps in more detail. Let me start with our role in national opportunity. It's a truism, I think, that navies go where trade goes, and UK trade is global. While we await the full details of the Integrated Defence and Foreign Policy Review, the government has already acknowledged the growing economic importance of the Indo-Pacific area. This month, the UK formally applied to join the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, CPTPP, bit of a mouthful, a group containing 500 million people, accounting for around 14% of the world's economy. UK trade missions have been working to deepen engagement with the ASEAN nations, a market again of 135 million middle-class consumers, which is expected, I understand, to double in size in the next decade. According to McKinsey, Asians, Asia is in line to top 50% of the world GP by 2040 and account for 40% of the world's consumption. In the coming months, Carry Strike Group 21, the UK's new Carry Strike Group capability, will be the largest deployment the UK and the Royal Navy has put out the door on its time for, I don't know, probably well over 20 years, and arguably the biggest since 1982, uh, when we recovered the Falklands. And whilst there is no doubt this is an expression of hard power and power projection, it will also send an equally strong soft power message. It was going to work across government departments to deliver exciting new opportunities for UK trade and industry, whilst, of course, if you like, reinforcing existing relationships with those friends and partners in an area of the world perhaps we've not been to as regularly as we should have done. It will be a floating advertisement for British technology and innovation. At its centre, of course, HMS Quid Elizabeth, uh, without doubt the most technologically advanced aircraft carrier in the world, and sitting on it uh, will be the world's most advanced fighter jet, the F-35 Lightning. It will underscore, in my view, the UK's position as the second largest defence export in the world, and there can be no better stage for which to showcase the best of British manufacturing industry, that's for sure. 
And alongside its commercial value, it will project this country as an outward facing, globally trading nation. I think something the population of the country forgets. In a year in which the UK will be present at the G7, let's not forget, and the fact we're going to host the UN Climate Change Conference in Glasgow soon, CSG 21 has been given equal weight by the government as an expression of UK global leadership. It has already proved to be a convening force, bringing together multiple nations, the Americans and the Dutch primarily, all three armed services and cross-government departments under the White Ensign. It really will be, in my view, the embodiment of global Britain. So CSG 21 is a fantastic example of the role the Royal Navy can play in the government's trade and prosperity agenda in the Indian Ocean and further east. But this is just one area. In Africa, the UK has 40 new partnerships. In the coming decades, eight of the 15 fastest growing economies are expected to be in that continent. And the Royal Navy must be ready to support the extraordinary UK energy investments already made by this government in Senegal and across the Gulf of Guinea. The UK, of course, sits at a gateway to an emerging northern sea route, halving the time for merchant traffic to ply between Asia and Europe. And the Royal Navy must be ready to respond there too. And we'll wait to see what our Arctic strategy says in detail in due course. And the blue economy. The rise of the issues on climate change, which I think we all recognise is probably the number one threat to mankind. The sustainable use of ocean resources for economic growth, which is, I think, estimated to be worth $3.2 trillion by the end of this decade. The UK is already a global leader in this through the government's Blue Belt programme, covering some 4.3 million square miles of maritime sea space, protected areas globally from Pitcairn to the English Channel. The Royal Navy must be ready to do its part in the blue economy, its part in protecting the blue zone, and its part of the Blue Belt program to safeguard this through the stewardship of our natural resources that fundamentally are so important to mankind moving forward. In his introduction, Peter mentioned I had the privilege of being the captain of Britannia Royal Naval College. Um, I often stood on the parade ground of that college looking up at the big building ahead of me. And carved into the front of that historic building is a quote from Charles II, which I think is even more apt perhaps than it was then. And it reads, it is on the Navy under the good providence of God that our wealth, prosperity and peace depend. I'm afraid this is as true today as it was 350 years ago. But with all the extraordinary opportunity if the government relaunches Global Britain, the Royal Navy needs to be ready for a greater role in that wealth and prosperity. But none of this opportunity for the UK or its part is possible without the freedom of navigation. It is almost becoming a cliche, I think, that 95% of the world's trade is carried by sea, but it's a truism. Cliche or not, it's a fact that has to be repeated given it's important. When this supply chain misfires or is constrained, global activity can grind to a halt. In a way, navies act as stents that you can put in close to the heart, the heartbeat of the world economy to keep that free flowing blood running. Security of the seas is global prosperity, but in recent years and increasingly slow, this is facing challenges. The concept of freedom of navigation and free trade is being threatened, there's no doubt about that. I see it with my own eyes at sea. It is the responsibility of the Royal Navy and other navies, of course, to support the UK's pursuit of relationships based on constructive engagement and cooperation all across the world. In this aspect of persisting competition, the Royal Navy already has a leading role. Last year in the Gulf, through operations Kippian and our Operation Sentinel, Royal Navy warships completed over a thousand days in operations to provide freedom of navigation through the Straits of Hormuz. Last year, HMS Kent, HMS Sutherland, and HMS Lancaster all operated inside the Arctic Circle. And we led a multinational fleet through the Barents Sea for the first time in 20 years, underlining our commitment to keep this region open for trade and normal routines, regardless of territorialization. But this competi uh, competition is persistent, and I have to say its pace is accelerating, both below that threshold of conflict and in terms of sheer hard power. 
Across the spectrum, these threats are evolving fast with emerging technologies and hypersonics, automation, digitalization, robotics, miniaturization, the list goes on, doesn't it? As we enter the information age with vigor. Developments in space and cyber, increasingly sophisticated aerial denial weapons pose new challenges, freedom of navigation, and those who defend it. And in crit critical for me, is what that means to our conceptual approach to operations, something that Peter touched on earlier. How do we cope with this? It's not as simple as it once was. This challenge, therefore, is bigger than navies, bigger than defence, and bigger than any one country. But as a responsible nation with global interests, the government's made it very clear the UK will step forward to play our part in this competitive and unstable world. I mean, I think through investing in alliances, investing in defence and through a strategic shift that will see our armed forces more integrated and more proactive in the shaping world is key. And a transformed Navy, and let me tell you, we're on the case with that, will remain an important factor. Naval forces have an arrival ability to build global ties, whether through naval diplomacy, deployments and engagements, joint exercises, training, or power projection in support of our allies, navies remain relevant. The Royal Navy is going to use these strengths to deepen existing security relationships, like our Five Eyes, and forge new partnerships around the world. Again, Carry Strike Group 21 is a statement of intent in that regard. And as the Prime Minister has reiterated, we will be the foremost European Navy in NATO and a continual, dependable, and powerful ally. And of course, Boris Johnson's announcements on the integrated review last November demanded a once in a generation modernization defense with increasing investment in digital, cyber, space, and AI. And for the Royal Navy, it means all eight ships, the Type 26 class, will be delivered. Fleet solid support ships to allow our aircraft carriers to operate persistently anywhere in the world. And of course, we're developing the next generation of warships, including the multi role research vessel and the Type 32 frigate, which will come after the Type 31. Steel on that shortly to be cut. And a confirmation of a new class of submarines to maintain our continuous at sea deterrent after the Vanguard class. And we need to develop, deliver on this incredible ship program and meet its intent. It is not just a reversal of decline, that's too simple. It provides the tools for a Royal Navy to transform into more proactive, flexible, and agile force. The breakdown of boundaries, it seems to me, both temporal and geographic, are going to be a feature of the 21st century. But perhaps we can pick up on that later. But also, we're building a navy to be out on the block, out on the beat, in an area, in an era, sorry, of persistent competition. In defence, we have this new concept called the integrated operating concept. It gives UK defence a clear way ahead in all this. Recognising our adversaries seek to win without resorting to war. Defence must be restructured to compete in this sphere, more proactive, more forward deployed, and integrated across the national security architecture, not least the agencies and across Whitehall. But, and I do make this point uh, to pick up on Peter's earlier, that we must retain our ability to war fight. If deterrence fails, then we could go to a shooting war very, very quickly indeed. And it's an area that the Royal Navy is working harder than ever, driven by the first EU Lord's transformation agenda to deliver upon. From the senior leadership down to our sailors and Marines on the front line, this is delivering undeniable and I have to say exciting change in my Navy. Through new ways of operating and by embracing technology in a more agile way, we are going to deliver a new era of maritime power power. The most striking example of this, forgive the pun, is indeed the restoration of the UK's carry strike capability putting, I think, the UK right back into an elite club of very few nations who do it properly. In the North Atlantic, we are operating in a much more assertive way in the last 24 months. We're changing our mindset towards technology and innovation, accelerating the rate at which we bring in autonomous and uncrewed assets, particularly mine hunting at moment. Projects already include the world's largest underwater drone and a host of cost-cutting edge anti-submarine capabilities. And to meet the spectrum of threats posed by the competitive environment, we are rethinking how we design and operate our vessels. The Type 26 will be much more agile with a huge mission deck. 
do modularization, it will be able to quickly switch equipment and crews depending on the nature of the competition from embassy facilities through to weapons. We're increasing the presence and availability of our naval units around the world to make sure we are in the right place at the right time to either maintain or reassert competitive advantage. We're forward basing many more vessels as we speak, maintaining them in theatre on long term deployments and through our hubs around the world. Maintain them, we are already basing batch two offshore OPVs in the Falklands, the Caribbean, the Mediterranean, with more to follow in key areas further east. Last month, we proved we could repair a complex warship in the Middle East as Montrose, HMS Montrose completed a maintenance period in Amman, allowing her to continue her work unbroken by a long transit back to the UK. And through the future Commando Force Programme, we are working to have a much more versatile uh, Marine Corps Commando Force, much more forward-based in the future. They are going to be equipped with the latest technology, ready to respond at a moment's notice, whether to provide humanitarian aid or indeed to fight. We're putting the VIM back in the commandos to cause mayhem behind enemy lines if required. In the past, we deployed units alone and on predictable episodic deployments. That is changing. Our fleet will be out in the world. We'll be constantly operating, the eyes and ears of the UK, delivering options to the government across the complete spectrum of competition, taking national opportunities and fulfilling global responsibilities. The potential of what we can deliver for the UK in the coming decades, I think, is really special. With the potential to be forward based around the globe with our wonderful new fleet, has come from projecting Global Britain as they are defending it, and all working in hand and glove with other instruments of national power. This will be a Royal Navy very firmly set in the era of persistent competition, an ambassador for the UK economic ambition and ingenuity, the very embodiment of UK's values of free trade and fair play, a powerful and dependable ally, and a permanent presence on the front line of competition across the globe. And if ordered, a technologically advanced, lethal adversary. The Royal Navy of the future, Peter, will be global, it will be modern, and I tell you now, it will be ready. Mm -hmm.